My name is Jeremy Keel. Just by way of introduction, I run um, I run an asset uh, management firm called actually two asset management firms. I have a partner in one called Sorensen Impact, which is really a uh, kind of multi-asset, you know, multi-strategy asset management platform and advisory platform that's that's completely dedicated to impact. We have a family foundation. Uh, you know, a, uh, an advisory practice that focuses on wealth management for impact. And then we have a series of uh, third party, uh, you know, managed funds that we, that we focus across asset classes, across impact themes in impact. One of those strategies uh, is specifically focused on the social determinants of health, which is a, a term that we'll, we'll talk about and unpack. Um, it's called Catalyst, and it's specifically focused on uh, affordable housing and other uh, sort of investment opportunities upstream in the community uh, that have real sort of you know health implications in low to moderate income communities. We invest in uh, affordable housing, uh, healthy and nutritious food options, uh, community-based healthcare services, uh, workforce training uh, services, and things like that. So that's kind of my background, and that's what I, uh, sort of the perspective I bring to this conversation. I'm joined by a couple of friends and colleagues. Uh, to my immediate left is Pablo Bravo, who is System Vice President of Community Health at Dignity Health, which recently became Common Spirit Health, uh, but I think we're still doing the co-branding there a little bit. So joined by uh, Pablo, who's, uh, who's a, a fantastic person and a real sort of thought leader and, and leading practitioner in this space. And then um, also joined by Andy McMahon, who's Vice President for Community Investing in Health, sorry, Community Investment in Health at United Healthcare, uh, which is obviously a very large um, healthcare system uh, here in the country. I, before I sort of get going and kind of pass this off to the panelists to really uh, get their perspective, I'd love to hear just among the audience that we've got um, sort of what your grounding is in the social determinants of health. And I want to do a little bit of a quick informal survey. Um, that, that phrase, the social determinants of health, how many people have heard that or come across that phrase just by show of hands? Oh, that's pretty good. That's a lot. How many of you are in a healthcare or related field or industry? Okay. Let's get out now. That's right, exactly. So that, yeah. Come so on there, up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's some good, some good overlap there. Uh, I, I guess one thing that I would put out there or posit for the group is that uh, th this room is sort of disproportionately uh, representative of folks in the healthcare you know, industry. A lot of the other folks that are roaming the halls of this conference or the other rooms of this conference who are less sort of focused on healthcare, more generally focused on impact investing, other strategies within that, um, you know, within impact investing. Um, they may not have heard of the social determinants of health, or if they have, it's been very recent. It's a, it's a term that's starting to kind of you know, become more common, uh, but but this is not sort of widely understood. I would say, in kind of the broader impact investing, uh, you know, community. So I think there's a little bit of translational um, work that has to happen there. Uh, I think people understand the concepts, but I don't think they sort of speak the same language that folks in the healthcare system do around this particular issue. Um, so for those of the for those of you that don't understand or haven't heard the term social determinants of health, social determinants of health. When I talk about that, and I'm sure people will define this differently, what I'm thinking about are sort of the upstream in the community uh, you know, elements or investments or opportunities that affect downstream um, you know, health outcomes. So things like housing, transportation, education, you know, community health care, uh, you know, again, sort of workforce issues, things like that. All those things in the aggregate uh, can translate into real uh, sort of presentable healthcare outcomes. And this is one reason I would sort of argue that health systems are really starting to kind of pay attention to what's happening in the community and starting to put, uh, you know, dollars towards those, uh, to those elements to try to drive better healthcare outcomes, better results, lower cost for the system. Um, and that's really what, what our guests are, are focused on in their own portfolios. So uh, I want to kick it over to uh, Pablo actually to start. And Pablo, I guess what I uh, would love for you to kick off with is sort of, uh, you know, helping the audience understand 
what your specific mandate is um, within your within your own group, and then within the larger kind of common spirit context. You know, why is the system interested in the social determinants of health? What kinds of investments are you making in the community uh, to address those those determinants? Sure. So first of all, uh, I'll give you some perspective around. So we are a large healthcare provider. We're in 21 states. We have over a thousand care centers, 144 hospitals. So we are definitely impacted by individuals um, who have uh, an impact on their health by the social determinants of health. And, 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 and the way we look at the social determinants of health is when it has an impact on individuals, it creates um, an impact on your, on your body, your stress. So that therefore uh, breaks down your immune systems and, and, and you, you can become sick and end up in one of our care centers. Um, from a community health, and, and that's my area, it's really we focus on everything outside of the hospital walls that are impacting the health of individuals that we serve. Um, for example, um, if access to food is an issue, we'll try to find a way to address that. We have, um, because we're a nonprofit, and, and a significant number of our nonprofit hospitals are required by the IRS um, to do community benefit. That means to put back into the community the equivalent that we save on taxes. So that's one side of the community health. Uh, we do that through either uh, doing prevention programs or awarding grants to communities for services. But then we have this other tool um, that we have created uh, as part of the overall um, investment program for the organization. It's, it's like a three-legged stool. You have uh, the perform, perform, uh, portfolio managed by um, investment backers, et cetera, um, that funds our um, self-insurance, our uh, uh, employee pension, and then the, there's an unrestricted pool of money that we use to replace capital, et cetera. And then we do shareholder advocacy. And then there's a piece here that we take a portion of the unrestricted funds and use it to create its program called community investment, uh, which is under community health. And the idea of that investment program is really to uh, put money into the communities that we serve in areas that have an, uh, are being impacted by the social determinants of health. What we try to do here is really focus on developing the infrastructure of communities to be able to sustain different issues uh, that are impacting the, the individuals in those communities. That's great. Andy, why don't you tell us where you sit within um, United Healthcare, kind of what, what your mandate is, the, the treasury funds that you sit on, and kind of how you think about your, your role within the organization. Great, thanks, and uh, great to be with all of you in uh, amazing weather. I will take it every day. Um, so yeah, so uh, not what I expected. Um, so, uh, so Andy McMahon, I actually sit uh, within Community and State, which is the Medicaid uh, organization within United Health Group. Uh, but a major hat that I wear is actually partnering with the United Health Group Treasury team. United Health Group is the corporate entity of all of the various parts of United Healthcare and Optum. Uh, so we are a very large kind of multi-service uh, business analytics and insurance company. So I sit on the United Healthcare on the ins managed care uh, insurance side. Uh, we have Medicaid plans in 32 states, covering about eight more than eight million uh, lives at this point. Uh, and so uh, I've been there about five years. And and the role and mandate, I think, uh, Jeremy, to your question that that I have is in partnership with our United Health Group Treasury team is thinking about where can we make investments in communities that we serve across the country. We literally have various components all across the, the country uh, and the globe. And so try to think about where are there social impact investments that we can make that, uh, that will align with kind of our organizational objectives and broadly speaking, improve community and population health. Uh, and so uh, I'll mention a couple things. So we do that through I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but kind of a, a two-pronged approach. So one is 
Uh, we leverage uh, both low-income housing tax credits and new market uh, tax credits is part, part one. For the purposes of this conversation today, uh, we have a separate uh, uh, large fund uh, for social impact investing uh, that comes out of our treasury dollars. I think one of the things that's important to know from where we sit, Pablo talked about kind of on, you know, on the nonprofit uh, side, where he has a, a lot of our resources actually come from regulated capital that we have within United Healthcare. So as an insurer, you can imagine we have to have enormous sums of money uh, on hand uh, and, and because we have to pay claims for things and, and pandemics do happen um, mm. and, and things like that. And so, you know, one of the things that's important for folks to know, I think, is that when we make those investments, uh, I won't get into the weeds, but insurance, health insurance, insurance is regulated at the state level, not the federal level. So every time we want to make an investment, we actually have to go to the state uh, health commissioner in, in the office there and get approval to say, okay, you're making an investment that somehow aligns uh, with healthcare. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about our, our philosophy and approach here in a bit. And w- just sticking with you for a second, Andy, what, what were the series of things that led to United Healthcare deciding to dedicate a portion of its treasury balance sheet to an impact sure. fund? So, so I think it started with housing, for sure. Uh, it started, that was definitely uh, our kind of key way in. I think, you know, there literally is not a person within United Healthcare who does not believe that housing is healthcare. I heard does believe, I said that wrong, but, um, but uh, you know, I think we understand very clearly that if you don't have a safe, decent, affordable place to live, the likelihood that you're going to have bad health outcomes and poor and overutilization of systems of care like Pablo's hospitals, um, that's kind of uh, a foregone uh, inclusion or, or knowledge. And so that, I think, was the starting point. And then as we worked, uh, Pablo mentioned food insecurity or some other areas, I think, we also then realized that another key driver for people around, around health outcomes and community health outcomes is access to care. So then we thought, okay, well, we need to be investing in, in financing and creating more uh, federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, and other health clinics in underserved communities. Uh, and, and that has then grown, I think now, you know, I'll talk a little bit more in a bit, but we just invested $25 million in a neighborhood health equity fund uh, in New England. To your exact point, Jeremy, right, it's going way upstream. It's saying we're going to invest in affordable housing, um, but also that it's close to transit, that has green spaces, it has grocery stores that are actually going to have fresh fruits and vegetables in them, uh, and the like. So I think it started with housing, and then I think there's been a just a growing understanding that there's these whole set of social determinants that we're talking about that you know have a, a huge impact. If this room almost all raised their hand, so I don't need to go through the eighty percent, twenty percent business, but it is true. So that's why we do it. Exactly. Right, Paul. Over to you. Do, do you? I mean, I assume you, there was a similar journey that started uh, for you guys with uh, you know dignity in terms of starting around housing and then kind of innovating and growing from there. Is that is that true? Or actually, when we started uh, in the early eighties. Um, the first uh, few investments were in CDFIs when CDFIs were beginning to first evolve uh, as a way to get them capitalized. Now CDFIs is a, a huge industry. Um, so from there, it was more about leveraging and extending a reach. Over time, as the portfolio allocation, you know, currently it's, a close, it's over $400 million. Uh, has grown, we have broken up uh, into sectors. And housing is a significant sector. But when we look at housing, we look at the whole continuum. So we look at how can we invest in recuperative care centers. These are centers, how many of you know about recuperative care centers? These are um, like step down from the hospital. So let's say you're well enough to leave the hospital but not well enough to go back home, or if you're homeless, not well enough to go back to the streets. So the step down would be from the hospital to respite recuperative care, where the, you engage the individual and you get them to heal. And then all the way up to home ownership. So we work with organizations to be able to um, purchase and stabilize neighborhoods so individuals, uh, low-income individuals actually can buy property. So we look at every supported housing, rental, et cetera. It's really interesting. Can you say a word about, you know, what type of capital you're putting to these projects? Uh, you know, Andy mentioned, you know, LIHTC actually buying sure. tax credits. Do you do some of that? Do you do debt, equity? 
We do all of it, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I'll start, for example, how many of you know Mercy Housing? Quite a few. So when Mercy Housing first started, we provide the first guarantee for one of their first loans. Uh, and look at Mercy Housing now, it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, we have provided pre-development loans for a significant number of large um, developers. Pre-development is the ri most riskiest, considered the most riskiest loans. Banks don't touch it. However, we put millions and millions of dollars into pre-development to get individuals get started. Um, to taking advantage of new market. So we'll, we'll, we'll invest, co-invest with either a bank um, that may have some gap financing um, for 15 years to be able to get the project off the ground. So we do whatever it takes um, to do it safely because we don't want to jeopardize the organization by get them debt and then all of a sudden they can't pay us back and they default and it just creates a whole mess. Um, but we want to be able to be there uh, should uh, any communities need us to develop a, a project. And when you say, just to clarify, when you say pre-development work, you're talking about real estate developers that are building, say, an affordable housing project. Exactly. Trying to get something going in their community. There's some upfront entitlement work that has to be done. The whole planning. Permitting, yeah, the whole all licensing, the whole <coughs> infrastructure. So a pre-development loan is get, is gets taken out by a construction loan. So it's everything to do with prior to construction. So it's the licensing, the permits, the um, um, you know the plants, etc. And that's a that's a there's a barrier to entry there because you you need some capital to kind of you know get the project going. But until you have a project that's investable, it's hard to kind exactly. of attract that capital. So you guys are kind of gap filling exactly. there. Exactly. So we try to uh, fill in. You know, we're always looking for projects um, because it's a, it's a unique program. So we're always looking for projects that we, without us, it couldn't move forward. Or we're the lender of last resort. Um, so we're always looking for those. So in, in impact investing, we're, we're always talking about kind of the, the risk return and impact, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, continuum and trying to think about where a particular product or investment sort of fits on that continuum. Talk to us a little bit about um, kind of the cost of capital that, that you provide and sort of, and maybe it's different for each of the different products that you're investing, or product types that you're investing in, but can you, you know, talk to us about sure. sort of what the, what the cost of that capital is? So um, the, the guidelines for the, for the program is that we have to maintain, the portfolio has to maintain a, a three-year average CPI. Currently, I'm totally out of compliance because <laughs> if you look at inflation, but um, my argument is inflation will come down and the, the three average will stay somewhere in between. <laughs> so, so we have loans from 0% to 5%. We normally don't go above 5%, um, but also take a, you have to take into consideration that we do not charge fees or closing costs or... Any other, so our cost of capital for the borrower is significant low. Okay. Yeah. So just, I just want to understand that. Just, just sort of emphasize that a little bit. But from the system's perspective, from Common Spirit's perspective, th this is concessionary money. If they put this money out with a kind of institutional, you know, financial management group, you would probably do better than the zero to five percent, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I it, would hope. Except, except right now, uh, my portfolio is out doing. The overall company right? portfolio. Oh yeah. Um, knock on wood, we haven't had any losses. I mean, our portfolio was asset manager. I mean, if you look at real, uh, the stock market, I don't know, yesterday or the day before yesterday, <laughs> yeah, um, was significant lower. Yeah, you're looking good right now. Yeah, um, <laughs> but that's temporary. The argument is that at the long time, long term, uh, you know, you'll see double digits. I won't see double digits. Right. Right. But. Um, if you take in consideration uh, the unknowns here, for example, if you provide housing for a community, chances are that the cost of providing services at the hospital is going to be reduced. Uh, if you help build a clinic up the street where individuals have primary care access, the chances of reducing the cost on the hospital is significant. So you have. 
even though it's really difficult to prove that in monetary sense, I mean, even though there's a lot of scientific evidence that says that addressing some of these issues ultimately reduce the cost, I wish I could, uh, I could prove to our system of the cost avoidance associated with investing mm -hmm. in, a, in, in, in a housing project. But I have proven that uh, investing in a respite care uh, has significant had, had an impact on the readmission of those individuals that were originally moved in. So, so when you take a look at the returns, if you add all these extras, chances are you're, you're seeing double-digit return. And do, do you, I, I mean, I, and that was actually answers to what question I was going to ask you, which is how hard do you try to, you know, measure and quantify these benefits? It sounds like you you might try, but it's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do, especially around housing. Uh, housing and healthcare do not talk to each other. You know, we have HIPAA and housing has all their other regulations. However, when we invest in supportive housing, we have an opportunity to kind of measure. Mm -hmm. Or in respite care or some other type of housing. Uh, you know, one of the projects that we did here was uh, mini homes uh, on Gulf Street. Uh, these are tiny little homes for homeless. And we're looking to see what kind of impact this is having. But if we have a direct relationship with the provider, we have an opportunity. But on, on, on large scale housing developments, it's very difficult. How much does that intuitive sense of the cost savings that, that you might be driving for the system, how much does that intuitive sense play into the sort of the buy-in that you have institutionally to invest these funds at sort of a concessionary rate? Is that, do people think, yeah, you know, they're making investments that are going to redound to the benefit, you know, from a dollars and cents perspective of the system, or are they just saying, "Look, we're a nonprofit. This is the right thing to do for the community." So this it is what it, we're it do. depends who you talk to. So if you talk to um, people in my realm, community health, I have staff all across the system, they'll understand right away if we make an investment on on a project in their community, they'll they'll get it. Um, you talk to a strategy, a business strategy person. And sometimes you'll get this, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And then you have to send them the articles too, so they begin to understand, oh, I get it. Uh, and then you have, and thank God we have the board and our, our leadership team that get it. Mm -hmm. They understand why we're doing this. We're doing this because it improves the health of the communities that we serve. And we've been in some of these communities for over 100 years mm -hmm. with our hospitals. So we've seen the impact that we can actually have. And so they, they understand that. Um, they understand that in an effort to really t have a serious conversation about keeping healthcare costs down, you need to be that anchor that's investing in those communities. Super helpful, thank you. Sorry to pick on that's you so a, much. No, yeah. we're, sim um, we're simpatico, but go ahead. Yeah, I'll, super yeah, interesting. I'm gonna, well, so I want to compare yeah, and contrast with yeah. the, the United Healthcare. He's a pair. He pays me. <laughs> right, which right. is interesting. So I have so, to give him... So, yeah, oh, well, good, good, ask your question, so, well, but it's very similar. Yeah. So let, let's start with the last question I asked Pablo, which is around, you know, how much buy-in do you have internally within United Healthcare to do this work? And the buy-in that you have, is it based on some notion of this sort of strategy driving cost savings for the system, or is it, dry, you know, something yeah. else? Like, what, what does so that look it's, like? So we have very high level of buy-in at the kind of top parts of the, the uh, organization, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but I think there's a, a few things that drive it for us. Um, so one, it is very little about cost savings. To, to Pablo's point, the problem with cost avoidance is that if you weren't charged it, how are you saving it? Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. So that, I think, I, I will tell you, when I talk to any of our people, I say, don't come to me and tell me about all the money you're going to save me or my system because it's not going to happen. Um, or we're not going to be able to quantify it in any real way. Uh, and so for us, though, I think there's, there's two big components to it. So every single investment we do, um, you know, I and our team need to demonstrate essentially the healthcare value proposition of what we're doing. So that everything we do has to align and be about improving community uh, and, and population health. Um, so that's number one. I think for us, um, we actually, I'm going to go back to Pablo's in a, in a moment, if you don't mind, Jeremy, because 
he and I are, are uh, kind of kindred spirits. So we too are looking, right? I'm the big, bad Fortune 5 company, and he's the wonderful nonprofit. We're, we're conceding return as well. <laughs> and, and we're looking to do, he's more eloquent than I am. I call it yeah. but for capital, right? But for our investment, the, the, the wouldn't happen. So just a, a note that we're two very different entities, and we're very aligned strategically on how we're trying to do impact investing, I think is, is important to know. You know, I get asked a lot, you know, Jeremy, to your point, when you say, okay, well, what is, you know, what do the finance folks say? If I, at least to your point, Treasury guy says, well, I could get 10% and you want me to give you this 25 million at 2%. 2%. Why should I do that? Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I need to demonstrate what, what I would call the healthcare value proposition. That isn't about saving us a bunch of money. It's about demonstrating the impact that this is going to have on healthcare. And then there's the business value proposition, which is that, you know, for those of you who work in, in Medicaid at all, right, there's a lot of health is Honestly, a lot of us have most of the same providers in the same network. A lot of it is common. And so the name of the game in Medicaid and procuring contracts is differentiation. So I create differentiation for United Healthcare, And I'm happy to do it because we're putting our money where our mouth is, right? We're saying, okay, I'm going to this state and saying, okay, we just invested $25 million to build you know, affordable housing that wouldn't have happened in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and it's important to know too, right, just so folks know, because we insure, you know, 8 million people on Medicaid and tons of other people, every single nickel of our impact and tax credit investment is what I would call in my new healthcare land plan agnostic, right? None of this is prioritized or set aside for our members, not a single penny, right? It's in investing in the community. Um, but so for us, it's being able to say, how can we create these kind of catalytic opportunities in the communities and then and be able to kind of say, okay, well, here's the impact that we had. You know, so if we, and I'll give you one example if you don't mind. So if we build a federally qualified health center in an underserved community, access to care is a huge issue for us in expanding access to care. So if I build a clinic and I, and I put $10 million to help finance a clinic, we can absolutely talk about the number of people who got access to care over a three or five year period. Um, and, and one other example on, just to carry on with that, that example is, you know, like Pablo, we're looking where we can do it strategically. We're extremely interested in conceding uh, return on investment. And a good example would be the, the fund that I mentioned where we're uh, financing uh, health clinics where we, I couldn't pay for this on an ongoing way on an annual budget. But what I did was figure out how we could concede return on investment so that we can pay for community health workers through our investment in the health clinics that we're helping to finance. Uh, and so uh, for those of you who aren't well versed in, in Medicaid, um, bizarrely, Medicaid very infrequently pays for uh, community health workers. So we usually can't bill Medicaid for them, which means they're really hard to pay for. And yet for our most complex care members, they're the most important person in the healthcare system. And so we're figuring out through our social impact investing how, we, how I can pay for that community health worker on site through our investment strategy. Andy, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you've, you've hinted at some of these product types that you're investing in, but I know you've, you've kind of pushed the envelope um, on the innovation side in terms of doing some really out of the box stuff. Can you just kind of catalog for us really quickly the types of investments you make, you know, the, the flavors of capital that you're putting in, whether it's equity or whatever, yep. you know, return expectations? Sure. So we're probably in a similar range, uh, honestly, in return of zero to five uh, with, uh, Pablo, uh, by and large, I'm looking at a couple others that are going to be very out of the box, where we're actually going to be looking to for higher returns, but for really, really amazing reasons. Uh, I can't talk about today. I'm not trying to be cagey, but um, um, but but so we do. We also do uh, equity lending, and we also do outcome based financing. So uh, a couple of examples, uh, and I'll be brief. But so we actually just recently uh, completed and got a return on our investment. Five years ago, we invested $7 million, and the Hilton Foundation out of L.A. invested $2 million, and we invested in the Justin Reach Initiative uh, with the L.A. County Jail, and we got 359 people off the streets, off of Skid Row, and out of the L.A. County Jail and into supportive housing. Uh, and, and that is a definitely a but-for investment. But for that investment, that would not have happened. And we put, right, I had, to, I had to risk mitigate it a lot up front, but we took that risk, right? If we didn't meet certain, there were two criteria around recidivism rates re and re-arrest rates, which are different things, but go there later. 
and housing stability rates. And if we didn't meet certain thresholds for that, we would have lost, uh, you know, on, principal on our investment. Uh, so we and we're also uh, investing uh, with Maycomb Capital and the Community Outcomes Fund with some amazing kind of pre-K work that they're that they're doing in Shelby County in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, with a similar dynamic. So we do uh, outcomes-based financing. Um, we do. Uh, Equity is probably the smallest portion of our portfolio, I would say. Uh, and then kind of what I would consider concessionary and catalytic lending is probably the biggest pot, right? Where we're trying to think about where can we make investments um, to, uh, to um, provide capital to, to projects. And, and another kind of but for example is that we recently closed a few million dollar investment on a project in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, it's senior senior affordable housing uh, with a co-located federally qualified health center, which is like the golden project from where I sit. I would invest in every single one of those deals. I hope there'll be there. God has to be more of them because right then you're ha you have your have your housing. Then you have people. Let's say it's a hundred unit building. Those folks are ha essentially have on site services. Mm -hmm. Honestly, and that's wonderful for them. More importantly, is that you've created a huge amount of access for all the other people that are going to be able to access care. Uh, in that setting, and so um, uh, so those are, I think are kind of the three main buckets. And I and I would just kind of reiterate that if you think about um, you know, especially you know, I work primarily in, in Medicaid, but and Pablo will know this well. But you know, it's it's honestly it's one thing to have health insurance. A lot of people don't. It's one thing to have health insurance. It's one, it's a whole other thing to actually access care. Exactly. And we have millions of people on Medicaid who have extreme difficulties. They're on our plans, but they're, it's difficult for them to access care. And so these strategies that we do around investment to expand access to care is so critical to supporting. Uh, and again, it's not specific to our members, but all, all the people on, on Medicaid. I, this is a question for both of you guys. Maybe we'll start with you, Pablo. But how, how uh, strategic you know, are you in terms of the investments that you're making, meaning you know, as a team, we're going to set not our very, priorities. It's not very. <laughs> <laughs> you can't answer for him. Yeah. We actually um, partner quite a bit. In the yeah. Business. So, we're, <laughs> but I guess the question is, how strategic are you and proactive about sort of identifying a strategy and then going out and exit, you know, finding product that sort of aligns with the strategy versus, you know, opportunistically seeing what comes in. There's a lot of interesting things out there. You mentioned Jackson, Mississippi. I'm thinking immediately about the water crisis in yeah. Jackson. So we're you know, do you guys have capital that's sort of flexible and open to kind of react to you know, community needs that pop up outside of the core strategy, I guess. So, first of all, our hospitals are anchor in different communities. So, my job within community health is always to engage with the community to identify uh, not only through our community health needs assessment, but also what the community is actually interested in doing mm -hmm. or what's impacting the community. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, during the real estate crisis, Stockton, California was gra considered ground zero. People were losing their homes, being foreclosed, being threatened. A lot of uh, uh, individuals were just leaving their homes. We identified um, a housing provider and, we, uh, and basically said, look, I'll give you a $2 million line of credit. You go and talk to the banks and try to buy as many of these properties on 10 cents of the dollar and let's st stabilize these neighborhoods. Um, so. That is because we have our connection with the community. So it's very important for us, wherever we invest, uh, is to have that community connection. Now, on issues like the environment, it's, it's different. We know that we, we can in, look at a project um, outside of any of our communities mm -hmm. that's going to ultimately impact all of us. Mm -hmm. So whether it's water, or fire, mm -hmm. or what have you. Uh, like, for example, it's just um, I'm currently having a conversation about installing solar panel. You should be interested in this. Solar panel in the, on top of FQHCs, Federally Qualified Healthcare Center, because of the fire. Because of the fires in California, the Federally Qualified Healthcare Centers, which are the primary care providers of a lot of our communities, have to shut down because of power. Mm -hmm. Also, you have individuals who are in life support systems that depend on power. So if you put solar panel on FQCs, you, you allow that, that clinic to continue 24 seven. So you wanna look at different projects, not only in the way they're gonna future impact the community, but also what the community wants to engage in. Got it. 
That's a long that, sentence. That's a brilliant idea. Andy, do you have a 15-second version of that? Because I have another question I'm going to ask you. <laughs> 15 seconds for you. <laughs> wow. Here you go. It's all chatterbox over here, and you give me 10 seconds. Um, no, I mean, I, I think... Um, you know, I, I actually would point to uh, the outcome space findings back, and I only mentioned a little bit about that we did, uh, we're doing with Maycomb, and, and looking at the outcomes that that has for kids, right? And there was a need to address pre-K education and other engagement things in the community. Uh, and so we certainly are trying to think about where there are needs identified in the community uh, that we are trying to be responsive to that. You know, we certainly have a set, we have a core set of, of kind of strategies and ways in which we invest. Um, and, and I'll just say kind of as, as anyone interested in talking to us or me later, I, mean, I think one of the things I try to tell people is that I, I mentioned this healthcare value proposition that is central to our work and to our investment strategy. I try to politely tell people you're allowed to go around the sun once to get me to addressing healthcare outcomes, right? I don't want the 19-step logic model that says, well, if you invest in Diet Coke, and then we do a recycling program, and then, and then, and then, we're going we're gonna to do that, which we get a lot of. And so, you know, I think we, we are trying to be responsive to the community's uh, needs. And then, you know, honestly, we try to ensure that we have um, appropriate guardrails for our investments while also providing the discretion because we don't know what we don't know and what's going to come our way. Right. Got it. So I want to leave a little bit of time for the, for the audience to ask a question or two, but I just want to end. I, I have to ask this last question because I think this is like, for me, it's the, sort of the root of the conversation um, as it relates to impact investing. So there's a lot of folks in the room that are, um, that are in impact investing that I think are interested in what you guys are talking about because it is concessionary. Um, it is catalytic. It does sort of bridge some of these financing gaps and in, in harder to kind of work in communities and places. And so I think it's really interesting what you guys are doing. Do you, and again, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a, a long answer, but do you guys think that you are on the van, you know, in the vanguard of something that is likely to grow in healthcare uh, to the point that, you know, Andy, your fund becomes much bigger at United Healthcare and other, you know, big systems are doing this and Pablo, your work get sort of replicated in other systems around the country? Or will you guys always kind of be, you know, a handful of, of folks doing this, you know, this work nationally? So one of the things that we did several years ago is with, other, with three other healthcare uh, systems is to create what we call the healthcare anchor network. Um, and that was a way to bring healthcare um, systems like ours together to focus on on, on, on on certain specific issues. So as, an, as, as these anchors were uh, economies in, in, in our own little community, so we thought purchasing, local purchasing would be a, 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 a one area to focus. Local hiring is the other area of focus. And community investing would be the other. So currently there are 60 um, members to the Healthcare Anchor Network Started it, with three? It started with three, wow. yeah. It started, um, yeah, Kaiser, um, Dignity Health, and, Trini and uh, Trinity. Another 60, and I would say about 30% of those are, are tipping their toe into this arena. Hmm. And we try to provide them with as much assistance as we can. And one of the areas that we, right away, we to get them engaged, we get them to focus is on community development and financial institutions um, because they're a great intermediary and, it's, and it's, it's almost a painless just make the investment and let it go and let them do the work. But if you really want to get down into the weeds, you really need to get involved in the communities and look at those projects that you're ultimately going to have an impact. But also, um, take a look at some uh, funds that normally our Treasury Department would not look into because they're too small. Like, for example, I don't know, how many of you heard of Black Star? Check, check it out. Uh, so it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a medium-sized fund, but not big enough for our Treasury folks to pay attention. Uh, and we're beginning to look at those as well. Sure. Andy? Yeah, so I think I, I, I would answer it in two ways, I think. So one, I think we... Uh, absolutely are looking to both expand and diversify our investments. Uh, I would just say that broadly. The, the other thing I would say that is, is really important from where I sit, and, 
And we have some interesting conversations internally because I mentioned the differentiation component to you all earlier. Um, but it's also, you know, and I'm not, I hope I don't sound whatever, but like we're trying to lead by example. And we hope others follow and come in and say, hey, you know what? The water's warm. If United Healthcare can go in and do this and invest here, then goodness on earth, we ought to be able to do that. And so honestly, I think we are definitely both trying to look to expand this, but also, you know, leverage candidly the influence and power of, of United Healthcare to get other entities uh, to act and to invest as well. You know, I think one of the one of the um, core, uh, I think, hopefully, kind of roles that we can play with a number of the people we invest in, right, is it's important the investment that we're making in them. And this is them telling me, not me bragging, right? Mm -hmm. But then they'll come back and say, oh, well, now, guess what? They then go tell every potential investor they're talking to, well, United Healthcare invested with us. So if, mm -hmm. if we're safe enough and we're good enough for United Healthcare, we ought to be good enough for you, yeah. right? And so that is yeah. you know, what I would call vouching, right? Is a really, really powerful strategy yeah. for growth. We've actually had projects where the project individual or someone was talking to a bank and they would say, well, you know, Dignity Health or Common Spirit is investing in us. And the bank says, well, why don't you tell us that? <laughs> we'll, we'll come in and just yeah. do that piece. So we actually, by the it's fact cool. that you even mentioned our names, the bank was uh, felt safer to do the investment. Thank we you. don't mind. Right. Because yeah. we're not a banker. That, that's their job. That's, yeah, bring more money. Yeah, yeah, bring it in. I'm um, sure. But, right? Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's really fantastic. Well, I, I know we're running out of time. Um, I think we have time for just one or two quick questions. Um, back here. I just want to applaud your collaboration the effort of going upstream to address the social determinants of health. I think it's fantastic. I've worked in healthcare. I've trained physicians in federally qualified health centers. I know what it's like on the front line. Two issues. One is, how are you going to recruit physicians to go work there without burnout? That's number one, because the burnout rate is 60% and above the primary care physicians currently. You've got a retiring group of physicians. There's a, there's a supply issue. That's one. The other is the finance side of it, which is there are alternative models out there in the Medicare market, like ChinMed and others, where they've actually disintermediated the insurance companies. And uh, have gone to glo global budgeting. So... You know, I think there's a need for competition of models out there, but I'd like you to respond to the issue of how you're going to get primary care physicians to stay and not get burnout. And two, what are the alternative mechanisms for supporting other innovative models? So how much time do you have? For <laughs> because I would have to call our HR folks. Um, you know, um, getting primary care providers to come to, 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 to into this world, it's definitely going to be an issue. Um, we're partnering with Morehouse, uh, which is a university, in an effort to get um, new physicians and, and new um, people in, involved in healthcare um, as, so as an entryway. But uh, we have seen that uh, practices uh, from uh, in, individuals of retirement age are, are closing down. Um, we're seeing that the younger physician are not interested in doing their own practice, but they would rather be employees. There's definitely a shortage, not only in nursing or, or, or physicians, that's going to be need to address. But to give you an answer right off the top of my head, it's it's really an issue that it's everybody is trying to figure out. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, left on the physicians, I mean, we're certainly doing a lot. In, actually around community health workers and nurses and others thinking about where can we support training programs mm -hmm. and provide incentives for people to do it. I mean, the healthcare worker shortage, I think, across the board is scary for all. I, when I say all of us, I mean all, all of, of us, us. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, of where we're at. And I think, you know, to your one question around kind of some of the, the global budgeting, I mean, I think, you know, from where we sit, you know, that's part of what I think I understand as, as somebody who works in, Medi in Medicaid managed care, right? We have to continue to evolve our own models and approaches and the extent to which there are others, right? That, that competition is healthy. I think that's, that's, you know, fair game. I think, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about and, and Pablo and I have laughed about, but I feel like, you know, in Medicaid, I, I try to identify a couple of key things. So there, when, right, when we're competing for contracts, there are a million and one things that we can compete with each other on. That's great. You win, I win, whoever wins, win, right? That, that was, and then there's a whole set of things where we unequivocally need to be collaborating on, 
right? And, 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 and I'll just, maybe my final comment will be, because I have this conversation, if not daily, weekly for sure, with some of our health plan leaderships, is to say, if you come in and, because I'll say, oh, well, we should collaborate with these three other health plans. And they're like, well, no, I want to do it because then we'll say we did it, right? Not our competitors. And what I try to explain to them is that, no, no, no. If you come in and you provide the leadership and the convening and you and you're the, the organization, our entity pulls the other entities together and we do something, it's a huge win for you because yeah. guess what? The state cares about all its flipping members, not just ours, <laughs> right? And so if we're come creating a solution for all of the state's Medicaid members and bringing our partners along, it's a home run. Yeah, yeah. if we have a, a healthcare provider telling us we'll take all your uninsured, <laughs> yeah, instead of just partnering, then fine, take it. Yeah. <laughs> I think, do you want to go with the quick question? Or? I have a question about the outcomes-based funding when you use that. Is that money ever returned to you, or is it really you're giving the money almost like a grant? Oh, no. No, we, we earned a return on the investment. Yeah. It was modest, but yes, yeah, so we, we invested $7 million, and then we had an outcomes-based contract with the County of Los Angeles with, with, with the Board of Supervisors and the LA County Human Services and the LA County Sheriff's Department. It was a thing, trust me. Um, it's, 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 and, uh, and, but so there we had a contract. So we invested $7 million up front. Our partners, right, the people who did the real work on the ground, let's be clear, the people who are housing people and connected care to them, they're doing the work, not me and not any of my Yahoo colleagues, right? So they're doing the work. But we, we pay for that up front. Then we demonstrate that we've reduced recidivism and reinvest rates by X percent, and then the county paid us back principal plus a modest return on our investment. I have to cut it off there, but I really want to thank you guys for the conversation today, for the great work you're doing in these communities. And I think, you know, just to bring it back to something you said, like for leading out and and creating an example in this in this area, which I and I, I, I asked that as a leading question a minute ago. I know this sector is growing. I know there's momentum in there. I'm familiar with the anchor network and have seen the growth there. Um, a lot of people are getting excited about this kind of work from these kinds of platforms. So I think it's, uh, you know, kudos to you guys for setting a great example.